Do you want to learn about psychological growth without sorting through the jargon? You're in the right place. This is the Relational Psych Podcast. I'm your host, licensed therapist Tyson Connor. On this show, we learn about the processes and theories behind personal growth and experience a little bit of it ourselves. Join me twice a month for candid conversations about therapy and psychological concepts with real mental health professionals using understandable language and simple experiments that you can try yourself. Keep in mind, this podcast does not constitute therapeutic advice, but we might help you find some. And today, my guest on the podcast is Brian Pendergast. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. Brian is a psychoanalyst, a writer, a teacher, and a trauma and human personality expert. And today, we are going to be discussing multiplicity of self. Yay. So, first of all, just because I feel like I need to get it out of the way, before we even dive into the topic, I want to acknowledge publicly, thank you for informing this podcast. Like, <laughs> uh, listener, I, I believe I mentioned this in the Welcome to the Relational Psych Podcast episode, but it was through a conversation with Brian that we had over coffee that some of the seeds of this podcast uh, were planted in my mind. So, Thank you for making this uh, happen indirectly, and I'm very glad that you can be one of our first guests. It yeah. feels appropriate. So. I'm glad that I got to uh, find out what seeds were planted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't often, you don't always get to do that right? as a therapist, huh? Uh, so, okay, that out of the way. Uh, multiplicity of self. What? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I thought you were going to ask me, I thought the comment that you were going to make was, okay, so which Brian is here right now? Oh, that would have been a smart question to ask. It would have been an interesting jumping off point, but yeah. maybe maybe we'll get there. Yeah. What does that question even mean? Right. I think that question comes from a bigger question, and that's, what is a self? Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I think that the the research indicated implied there's a core self there's one self we mm. need to find that self be in touch with that self and i think the neuroscience of the past 30 to 40 years it really started in the 90s with uh, george h bush um and what was called the decade of the brain that's when neuroscience there was money put into more learning about the brain and mental mm -hmm. health and mm -hmm. what came out of it in the subsequent decades was this understanding that we don't just maybe have one self, but that there are many parts, many selves, many self states. There's mm -hmm. different phrases for it nowadays, but that we're switching mm -hmm. around all the time within within these selves and self states that it's not just one thing that we go back to. Yeah. So a couple things. One, when you say George H. Bush, you mean the president? Yes, thank you. President George H. Bush. What did what did he do that helped the develop a decade of neuroscience? Or? I mean, it was some legislation. I don't yeah. know the the gritty details of it, sure. but there was some legislation in the the late 80s and early 90s that was aimed at pouring resources into learning more about mental health. Wow. And so that's where this revolution of understanding mental health via some more advanced neuroscience came from that's fascinating yeah i never knew that so okay interesting little historical anecdote very cool <laughs> um what i'm hearing you say is that for a very long time the like attitude the general approach to thinking about a self was that there's like one core version of you there's like the real you somewhere mm -hmm, in there mm -hmm. and the the goal was to become that be your your true self right like yep. that's a phrase from Who's that? Is Winnicott. that Winnicott? Yeah. So like that that idea was prevalent throughout psychology and popular culture. Everyone was trying to be their their honest and genuine self. Yep. And what I'm hearing you say is that starting in the 90s, people started to be able to learn a lot more about brains and how they work and how our minds function as an extension of that. And what we've learned is that that's not really how people work. There's not one self. There's like a a bunch with a lot of different names for like what they're what we call them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And if it, it's best, I think, if you think about it like the brain and the nervous system, right? Mm. And there's authors that call it the body brain, right? That they're just mm. so interconnected. Yeah. That that's the electrical wiring 
for our selfhood in a lot of ways. That's the electrical wiring for who we are. Okay. And so the easiest way that I like to think about it is the idea of neural pathways. Mm-hmm. There's there's neural pathways in our brain that get developed every time we have some sort of experience that is strong or repeated or both, right? Mm. So the the strong one might be like you think of an, an experience of someone being abused, okay. right? That's a very strong experience. And a lot of times they relate to something dangerous mm-hmm. or something dangerous and then um, feeling some safety after there being something dangerous. Okay. The brain catalogs these things and kind of says, ooh, that's significant. And it gets stored in long-term memory. And that's a neural pathway in our brain. And so the next time, if if there was an abuse experience, the next time someone encounters something that looks similar to that abuse experience, that neural pathway is easy to find. And then that's what we have when we think about trauma triggers, mm, right? Something, okay. something reminding us of an old experience that's stored in long-term memory because it was significant and there was some danger involved and our brain goes there. Okay. So let's... So for example, let's say I'm an 11 year old on a paper route and every day on my paper route, I ride past the house with the dog out front and Mm -hmm. the dog barks at me and my brain is like, whoa, that's a barking dog or yep, that's the barking dog. And it's an experience that I have, but whatever, there's a dog on the other side of the fence. My brain doesn't really do much with that experience. Notice it, maybe get startled a time or two. Might be good to help me wake up and do my paper route a little bit faster. Right. But if there's a day where the dog breaks free and bites me, um, that experience is a lot more intense. There's a lot happening there. And my brain says, oh, that's important. We're holding on to that. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes a neural pathway. Right. And that means that when you encounter a dog 20 years later, it's a different experience because of being bitten. The analogy that I've heard described by Michael Powell and the food guy is imagine freshly fallen snow and skiers that are going down on freshly fallen snow and they uh-huh. create tracks, uh-huh. right? The The experience of a neural pathway is tracks being laid in the brain. Mm. Well, mm. if there's a set of tracks that are there regarding this dog biting you at age 11, if you go skiing near those tracks your skis are going to naturally kind of land in those previous tracks. Uh And so that neural pathway of all dogs are dangerous and are going to bite you and hurt you, you're going to slide into that that track, right? Right. And so these neural pathways that get traveled over and over and over again, they become a self Mm -hmm. in a way, right? They become a self-state, a part of us. There's different language that's used, but that's how we know that we're multiple because these neural pathways keep sending these similar signals that become more than just a, a temporary feeling. They become something that we're familiar with and that we return to and that feel like me in those mm-hmm. moments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in, in this example of the dog bite situation, if that's, if that's a neural pathway that I have, and then for the rest of my life, whenever I'm around a dog... I, I feel that terror again. Mm-hmm. I feel that I feel that fear again. That version of me, that self state, gets reinforced and gets solidified. That there's a version of me that says dogs are scary and are out to get me. Yes. And maybe there's another version of me that is like able to sit on the couch watching TV and like Lassie comes on the screen, and I'm totally fine mm-hmm. because the part of me that says dogs are scary and out to get me isn't triggered by watching television isn't right. triggered by seeing something on the screen so those are two different versions of me parts of me self states there's different language for it but in one of those dogs are scary and out to get me and in the other one lassie's going to save timmy who fell down the well yeah always right and it's good is the good guy mhm mhm and it gets maybe more complex if you think about when you got bit by that dog If you were able to go home and talk to a caregiver right away and say, I just got bit by a dog, I'm really scared, and that caregiver was attuned to you, they listened to you, they heard you, they held you, they understood you, that gets held in a different way in our long-term memory. It's not just an experience of danger, it's an experience of danger than safety, and so that neural pathway actually feels different. You might have a moment of 
panic when you hear a dog bark 20 years later, but you'll probably recover more quickly because you were heard and understood and met with empathy shortly after the experience. Okay, so this is interesting because what what you're talking about right now, I I would imagine if there are listeners right now who are hearing this, they might be like, okay, yeah, I've heard of this before. I know what a trigger is. I'm I'm familiar with the idea of trauma um or even like a flashback, right? All this sounds familiar. But now this this sounds this might be new to some people. Hmm. That like you can have that scary, overwhelming, even life-threatening experience where if shortly afterwards you feel safe, then that scary, life-threatening experience, that trauma response, that trigger, that self-state might not be as like deeply ingrained? It might not be as deeply ingrained and might also not be as compartmentalized or the fancy word we use a lot of times in clinical circles is dissociated, mm. right? And that's where it's like a self has really thick walls around it. Mm-hmm. And like the walls are so thick that you can't hear other parts. You can't hear your happy self in the room next door, like whistling. And you're like, oh, I have a happy part of me or I have a safe part of me. I'm going to be okay. When we're dissociated, when we're compartmentalized, we get stuck in thinking that is the only truth there is. Mm. And that's where that that component of somebody being able to be with us after a traumatic experience and help us process it and be with us is so important. And why when that's not there, uh-huh. it makes the trauma more complex. Interesting. And why then therapy can be useful in that. The dog bite incident maybe doesn't work quite as well if we consider um, – a therapeutic example later on, if we consider something more like I was never picked up for soccer practice on time. My parents Mm -hmm. always forgot about me and Mm -hmm. it became this like chronic neglect experience. I'm just forgotten about. Yeah. And then you go to therapy and you start working with your therapist and maybe one day your therapist forgets about a session Uh or or something Uh and you get that, that trauma trigger, right? It's like that old, that neural pathway got traveled in that moment. Uh Uh-huh. And if your therapist is able to talk with you through it and repair the experience, that grows a new neural pathway that makes it then safer uh-huh. to go into experiences where you might be forgotten about. Gotcha. So having a different experience of the response to the trauma or of the other person being present after the trauma changes changes an entire self state potentially i think it it uncovers another self state is how uh, i like to think about it that we we really do have infinite selves right because all the experiences that our brain is encoding if if they're repetitive enough mm-hmm. they create a self state and a lot of times they can be called feeling states too okay right so there's anxious me right oh anxious mm-hmm. me just showed up right before this podcast and i'm like okay how's it going to go i'm excited but i'm a little bit anxious and yeah. that The experience of feeling something repetitive in a repetitive way can be a a self-state or a self. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it sounds like for really intense and especially really like painful experiences, then we can develop these feeling states and self-states that are like really siloed, really like a a separate, alone, atomized, dissociated, Mm -hmm. disconnected Mm -hmm. from all the other self-states. And it sounds like what you're suggesting is if we're able to sort of slip into that self-state and have somebody to connect with us and work through it with us and be present with us, then that's kind of like drawing a little bit of a connection to all the other parts of ourselves. Right. If the goal of mental health is to be integrated, and I believe that it is, Mm -hmm. right, that means... We are able to be aware of all of ourselves or as many of ourselves as possible at any given moment, even if we're not um, entrenched or or employing all of them at the same time. I like to think about it like a a 15-passenger van. I used to be a a youth worker, and so I would drive this 15-passenger van that would almost tip over on mountain roads. It was Mm -hmm. terrifying and fun at the same time. Everybody's singing in the back. But 
if who you are is a 15 passenger van uh -huh. and you've got all these parts of you, which are probably more than 15, but let's just say for the sake of argument or the sake of the analogy, there are 15 parts of you in that van. You only have one driver at a time, right? Like we're only right. in one self state at a time, but why sometimes is our abused self or our neglected self kicked to the way back of the van to not be heard from, or maybe even having to hang out under the seats. Mm -hmm. We don't want to know that part of us. We don't want to even know that they're in the van mm -hmm. in so many ways. And I sometimes think that therapy is a way to help find the parts of us that we've said, get under the seat. I don't want to know that you even exist. I don't even want you to, to be a part of who I am. You mess things up for me yeah, or whatever. We think of these more hated parts of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, this is making me think of maybe it's just because we just recorded the episode on like the history of like what is psychoanalytic and psychodynamic psychotherapy. So we talked a little bit about Freud and so maybe I got Freud on the brain, <laughs> but like in one of his uh, three essays on sexuality, he talks about the like his his understanding of repression he talked about like a you know the the lecture hall image mm. of like i'm i'm here standing here in front of you at this lecture hall and there's someone in the front row who's causing a real ruckus and it's disturbing he probably didn't use the word ruckus unless that's a german word in which case i like to it. believe he did but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and and eventually this person is so disruptive that i ask the the, the people who work at this university to please throw the man out, right? This this disruptive man is causing trouble, so we throw him outside. Mm -hmm. And then Freud said to to the people, well, what, is, what does he do in the lecture? He's going to pound on the door and yell and scream. And even though we've thrown him out, he's still disrupting. Yes. And so what Freud said is the way to calm down the man is to let him back into the lecture hall and hear him out. Mm -hmm. Hear what he has to say. Mm -hmm. Take him seriously. Mm -hmm. And then, having been listened to, he will likely sit back down and be a part of the lecture again. Yep. That's that's coming to my mind as you're describing it's this a dynamic. Beautiful way of understanding it. Yep. That selves don't go away. Parts of who we are don't disappear. Mm. Right? That in the van analogy, maybe we don't give them the keys. Sure. Right? Because yeah. if 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 anxious me um, decided to show up for this podcast and was given the keys to the car of who I am, uh -huh. I wouldn't be able to speak intelligibly, right. right? I would be all over the place. I'd be tapping. I'd be you know causing all kinds of um, audio disturbances. So I had to kind of say, okay, you get to hang out in the van, but you don't get to drive, mm -hmm. right? Because the parts of me that are excited about talking about this, the parts of me that feel confident in being able to talk about this material need to drive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. need to be the one that is most employed as I bring myself forward in this interaction. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to summarize, what I'm hearing you say is we all have infinite <laughs> different parts of ourselves, right? right? And some of them are very strong and powerful and in charge and present a lot and some of them are kind of smaller and less impactful and mm -hmm. present rarely and some of them are very strong and powerful and are exiled out far away yes <laughs> and the goal of psychotherapy as you understand it and as you're proposing which i think is interesting is to get all those parts of a person's being all those versions of a self to be able to be in conversation with one another yep, inside of one person's mind. Right. And sometimes we have to take what is internal, make it external before it then can become internal again. And so that's what I mean by psychotherapy being a place for that to play out. Yeah. Explain that. That sure. sounds fascinating. <laughs> right. So if, if I've got certain parts of me, and, and I'll use the example that I used um, in my book that I wrote mm -hmm. a little over a year ago. Um I have a part of me that um, when I was in eighth grade, I stole some money from a kid's pants uh, after school in the locker room, mm -hmm. found a pair of pants. I was like, I want some Skittles from the vending machine because what eighth grade boy doesn't want Skittles mm -hmm. and dug into this pair of pants. And there was a buddy of mine doing it with me and we found some money. We went to the vending machine, mm -hmm. came back, found some more money. And, um, I was kind of gloating, you know, I had a $10 bill uh -huh. and 
this other kid while we were waiting to get picked up said, you know, I heard you found some money and I was acting all like I'm the biggest badass there is. And my dad came to pick me up and I chucked the crumpled up $10 bill at him and didn't think anything of it and just went on my evening. And then the next day, this friend at the lunch table was like, Hey, I I had like $14 stolen from my pants yesterday. And I was like, Mm. Oh, I, that was me. I know where your money is, man. I've, I've, you know, here's, here's a dollar that I borrowed and you know, this $10 bill, this other kid has it. Well, he got called down to the principal's office and eventually I got suspended. Wow. And it was like the most terrifying thing for this good churchy kid to experience. And my parents like didn't, they looked, they looked right past it. They didn't see the thief that I was. They were like, oh, he would never do such a thing like that. That's not our son. You know, Yeah. when he found a wallet on the ground, when he was seven, he returned it to the owner. Like that's not who he is. So I like to call it thief Brian, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They didn't pay attention. They didn't see that that was in me. Yeah. So then in ninth grade, I'm on the golf team and I go to the the sports store and switch a few tags on a golf club and like steal a golf club, Mm -hmm. essentially, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm starting to do stuff out of this part of me. My parents were none the wiser, didn't know about it. I get all the way into my thirties and I'm working with a psychoanalyst Uh and uh, she's like, Hey, uh, your bill is a couple months late. Like, when are you going to pay me? Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I promise I'll I'll pay you, you know, just eventually don't worry about it. And just time would go on. And it's not technically stealing to pay someone late, but it, it kind of is in a way, right? Mm. It's inconveniencing somebody. And she called that out and said, you told me this story once where you sort of stole money from a kid's pants and you've never really acted as if you did anything wrong. Uh-huh. And it's like she uncovered this part of me by being like, you're kind of stealing from me, mister. Uh-huh. Like, you owe me money and for services already rendered. And it's like she saw what my parents didn't see. She saw a split off state, a split off self, this part of me that had the capacity to take from people and not yeah. think about the consequences, right? And it, it would surface in little areas as an adult where someone would buy me dinner and I'd be like, oh, I'll pay you back. And I never did. Yeah. Right. And so it's like it became, we could use the word pathological in a sense, Mm -hmm. but very subtle. Yeah. You know, and so the therapy experience, just by her being who she was and interacting with me with her natural, like, hey, I want to get paid, helped uncover this part of me that I was like, no, it doesn't exist. I'm not a thief. I don't take advantage of people. I don't do anything like that. Yeah. And yet that's what I was doing. Yeah. And I think that's where therapy can help us kind of expose some of the parts of ourselves that we have either hidden or we've exiled, like you said, Mm -hmm. that we just don't want to exist. And sometimes it's, it's an abused self. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's a narcissistic angle of who we are and we just like can't bear to incorporate it or own it and say, I guess that's me. Yeah. Because once I could realize that, that's when I stopped acting like that with money with Uh people. Uh Right. Because I was like, oh, I don't, I don't need to, to kick this thief part of me to the back of the van. Mm-hmm. And therefore, he doesn't come up and steal the wheel right. <laughs> anymore sometimes. Right. Yeah. So it, it, what, I'm, what I'm hearing you describe is, you know, because this, this started with me asking about this idea of it going out first before it can come back in. Yes. Right? Is that you, there was this part of you that first came out, at least in your memory of it, yeah. with this this stealing in middle school and the the people in your life the important people never addressed it Mm -mm. they it it was a part of you that showed up it sounds like it was a little like disorienting confusing Mm -hmm. disruptive something distressing lots of d words (laughs) (laughs) and everyone just kind of was like nope uh, uh, nope gotta pretend it's not there Mm -hmm. and so then this part of you becomes like we were talking about before, siloed and dissociated, disconnected. Banging on the door of the lecture hall. Right. And coming up in these kind of sideways ways Mm -hmm. that you didn't have the tools or the skills or the experience or the context, the holding, lots of different words to describe what what you may be needed to bring that part of you back into conversation with the rest of you. Yes. And so because of the particular 
like relationship that you had with your analyst, that part of you came up there by yes. not paying the bill. That part of you showed up and was causing disruption by getting in the way of you paying what you owed, stealing indirectly. Right. And she was able to speak to that part of you directly and essentially say, I see you, little thief. Mm-hmm. And guess what? You're you're a whole part of this. Now yes. let's be serious about it. And and I think what was so profound about what she said was, I see you, little thief. You're accepted here. You're welcome here. But you can't keep doing that. Yeah. Right? Ooh. Chills. Yeah. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And, and to then be able to do that. She was modeling for me what I needed to do for that part of me. Like, okay, mm. I see that part of you you belong here you're you're accepted all parts of all parts are welcome so to speak within us and yet i gotta regulate that part of me because if he runs the show sometimes he's gonna get me in trouble yeah yeah and what you're describing makes me think about sort of this com this like truism i suppose of a relational therapeutic Hmm. like approach which is the idea that what begins interpersonal what exists between people becomes intrapsychic becomes what happens inside of one person's mind right what starts as an interaction between two people can be taken in to be something that we're able to do for ourselves right and it sounds like what i'm hearing you advocate for is that is for a therapist to pay attention to the parts of a client that they don't know what to do with Mm -hmm. and do something with them right preferably something kind (laughs) right right yeah analogy that i heard from a friend or maybe not an analogy but an understanding about therapy was the idea that what if you imagine this room this therapy office to be your mind which parts of you are not allowed to come in to this office right Mm -hmm. and that we all probably have those kind of things and and work with somebody in therapy long enough because you feel like it's a good fit those more of those parts are going to show up and they're Mm going to come in and you're going to be like okay we're going to have to deal with this and i think that is the practice of integration on a macro level and i think the micro level is the story that i just shared and how you described it that there's a an interpersonal interaction and the more that that gets worked out with enough safety Mm -hmm. then we can incorporate it internally and then we feel more integrated so that we don't always need the therapist to help us walk through it because mm-hmm. we've internalized it. That's where the neural pathways come in, right? We, the, the new neural pathways, when it when we work through something with a therapist, it's like, oh, I get to take that with me. That's in my brain. That, I don't mm-hmm. have to have my therapist with me 24-7 like I think I do right. sometimes early on. I'm like, how am I going to handle this? I don't know what to do. Well, the more that we work with our therapist and feel safe and have those neural pathways grown, it's like we've taken them with us. But more so, it's like we've taken the relationship with us. Right. And it sounds like... I think what I'm hearing you say is that like with enough practice, you don't need necessarily to practice this cycle with every distinct part of you Mm -hmm. because infinite possible selves, infinite possible repetitions, Exactly. but rather the more you've practiced having that experience of this exiled separate part of yourself being invited in and being told like, yeah, you're here and you're welcome and you're part of this person. Right. You essentially learn how to neural path find. (laughs) That's a great, I love that phrase. I think you need to coin that. <laughs> well, I just did. <laughs> a neural pathfinder. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> nice work, nice work. A tabletop RPG coming in <laughs> December 2025. Count me in. Yeah. 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 A common question, I, I didn't I didn't think about this ahead of time, but mm. it it comes up from time to time. When I tell people, hey, I think we have multiple selves, another way of saying is we all have multiple personalities the question inevitably comes up. Do we yeah. all have multiple personality disorder? And I I uh, like to say, well, first of all, it's called dissociative identity disorder now, DID. Mm-hmm. And no, we don't, right? right? I think the difference between someone who might have a diagnosable disorder regarding dissociation like DID is if we go back to the analogy of the different rooms, if a, if a house is, is you, right? Mm-hmm. And each part of you resides in a different room, mm-hmm. For people who have severe dissociation, the walls are just so thick mm. that there's there's not a way to be in one of the rooms and be aware, at least until there's some treatment, be aware of other parts of self. 
Yeah. Whereas most of us who would, who have not been diagnosed with a dissociative, excuse me, a dissociative disorder, mm. we have some awareness of other parts of us most of the time, unless we're in like a very heavy trauma zone experience. Right. Right. And the the way that you know one of the you know diagnoses are complicated, but one of the the diagnostic criteria that comes up when people you know I work with a lot of adolescents and adolescents like to self diagnose mm-hmm. because adolescents love being able to say this is what I am yes <laughs> because you know what so do all of us <laughs> but mm-hmm. adolescents just are less worried about it being judged for it yeah I think um, but. Uh, uh, oftentimes they will ask me like, do I have dissociative identity disorder? I feel like a totally dis- different person when I'm with my theater friends versus with them with my basketball friends. And then the question is, well, do you remember what happened when you were with your theater yes. friends? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. Well, there you go. Yep. Um, it sounds like for someone with a disorder that you can diagnose, um, the walls are so thick that it's not just, we can't imagine what it would be like to be in that feeling state or in that self state. We can't hear what's happening. It's that what I experience when I'm with my theater friends isn't even remembered when I'm in It stays in that room. It uh, it stays in the room. The door, it's not just thick walls. The door is locked. Yes. And ventilation is poor. Right. Right. That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. I, I think it is. I think dissociation... The interesting thing about dissociation, and, and you probably know this, is that it's the brain's natural way of keeping us sane. Right. Right. It it when when there's trauma happening, we get overwhelmed, and dissociation is like taking us outside of ourselves so that we don't go crazy. Mm. And so it's like a helpful mechanism that comes with its own set of problems. Right. Because then we right. feel disconnected from our the other parts of us. Yeah. There was this, <laughs> I might edit this out because this might be too revelatory. When I was in uh, undergrad, I was in a theology class and my professor was talking to us about the definition of a heresy within Christian theology. Hmm. And what he said was that uh, the his best working definition of a heresy was a truth taken to an unhelpful extreme. Hmm. That when it came to Christian doctrine, most heresies were based on something true, but taken to an extreme that became harmful Mm -hmm. to those who believed it. And that definition, I think uh, it stuck with me in part because it's, it's a cool phrase, but also because I think it applies to a lot of mental illness and a lot of mental disorder and distress. And like when we're talking about dissociation and you're talking about how dissociation as a process of taking a part of you that experiences something overwhelming and and scary and confusing and being able to say, you know what, that experience is going to go over here for now so that the rest of me can like hold together. That's, that's a truth. That's a helpful, useful thing. Mm -hmm. But when we take it to this unhelpful extreme of and you know what that part of me is staying far away mm. i'm never bringing that part of me back it goes right. over there that's when we run into trouble right because it's still making noise back to the guy right freud's guy outside the lecture hall right it's still banging on the doors in some way right it might be somaticization it might be you know uh-huh. ways that people are experiencing us that we're not aware of Somaticization. Say some. What, what's that mean? Uh, the body's way of expressing uh, what could be going on psychologically for us, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes, if we don't have words or we don't have awareness of what's going on emotionally for us, sometimes our body will express that with pain points. Or, mm-hmm. um, you know, for for me, a lot of times, if I'm anxious, my stomach feels a little bit upset, right? Yeah. And if I'm not aware of it and, and not able to address it, I'll feel it in my gut. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's semi common. Headaches are another one. Mm-hmm. People feel their feelings in their body sometimes, and that's yeah. what I think of when I think of somatization. Gotcha. And it sounds part of what I'm hearing you say is that sometimes we can so disconnect from some part of ourself that it's like it's not even thought, it's not even feeling we can identify. Right. It's it's a bodily sensation. Uh, it's something that lives inside of our bodies more than our brains or memories. Right. And I think when it comes to 
integrating outside of relationship, right? Because we're talking a lot about how do we get integrated mm -hmm. in relationship by people um, seeing other parts of us that we can't see. I think the best we can do when we're by ourselves is to look back, right? Mm -hmm. To in retrospect be like, whoa, what part of me was that that just said that thing that uh -huh. kind of felt like a switch in me or wow, that was interesting. I didn't I didn't think I was feeling that. And now I'm feeling that. It's like being able to catch it afterwards still counts, right? Mm -hmm. As a way to get integrated. Because the more we get in the practice of doing that, I think the more we can learn to catch it sooner and sooner and sometimes in the moment and be like, whoa, a feeling just came up for me. A part of me just showed up. Angry me is here. Whoa. Uh -huh. Okay. Where did that come from? And when when we can get to a place where it slows down enough, then we can start to choose, and this is this is not always conscious, but we can start to choose selves mm, to mm -hmm, employ, mm -hmm. right? We can start to choose stories yeah. to believe in, right? Because yeah. the idea of like we tell ourselves stories when we get going in places, if we can catch it, we can go, okay, I know that story is there of, oh, this person's going to leave me. This person hates me. This person doesn't like me anymore. They didn't text me back. They usually do. Yeah. When we can catch it and recognize, okay, that's my anxious self from, you know, childhood mm -hmm. when when people didn't pay attention to me they didn't follow up with me they didn't care they missed my birthday or whatever right and say okay i i'm i'm going to choose to believe this other story that is more related to what is going on in my life right now mm. but i think that again takes work with people in relationships before right. we can then start to do it on our own yeah and that that relates to one of my one of my professors in grad school would talk a lot about uh, the power of pausing and the idea that if you pause, then you can make a choice. Yes. And that oftentimes when we found our, find ourselves falling into those, those ruts, falling into those tracks, the ski tracks, it, we, we don't have time to pause. It's right. not a choice. It's just a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you say is that with practice, you can get to a point where you can hear multiple voices, multiple parts of you speaking at once and pause long enough. To, I mean, mixing a lot of metaphors right now, but long enough to decide who gets to drive the van. Yeah. Like you can feel yourself going down into this place, let's say conflict with a partner, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a part of you that pops up that's saying, they always do this to me. They're taking advantage of me. They know they're hurting me and they want to hurt me to prove they have power over me. Mm -hmm. But you have enough of a pause to hear that voice and also hear another voice that says, my partner is here with me and mm -hmm. for me and we're on the same team and we're in conflict right now. And if I'm honest about it and open and vulnerable, they likely will be too. And we will reconnect and we're not out to hurt each other. Right. And you can choose to let that part of you or some other part mm -hmm. take the wheel. Right. Yeah. I think that's where the continued building of the neural pathways that feel more secure mm -hmm. are so helpful because if you imagine those tracks in the snow you're coming to the top of the mountain and there's in this case two tracks yeah they don't care about me they always do this to me and that's one from childhood yeah. and then there's this new one that has formed of oh, they, my partner cares about me they they're interested in working this through with me they're maybe having some feelings of their own about it but they care and the more that track becomes traveled the skis are going to slide into that one more yeah. easily than the old one yeah Whew. this is neat <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad yeah i think it's neat too um I, I don't know if this is this is quite in the purview of what what we wanted to talk about today but um i'm curious to hear your thoughts about like we're kind of going to bring in a little bit of like personhood of a therapist now like a client's not the only one with multiple self states mm -hmm. with multiple parts of the self showing up in a therapy room. How does the reality, the fact that a therapist also has a bunch of different selves present, how does that, how does that impact the work? I think it impacts it greatly. I think that's why it feels important for us therapists to, you know, do our own work, be integrated enough in a way where we can notice when different parts of us show up. And, and mm -hmm. for, for your listeners, if you're a client in therapy, 
to be able to kind of notice like, oh gosh, my therapist feels like a different person in that last comment that they made. Or when when I showed up this week, they seemed a little bit different. And to be able to just kind of note that and maybe talk to your therapist about if you feel comfortable and safe enough. Mm. But I do really think for me as a therapist, the part of me that I notice pops up that feels a bit stark to my clients is almost like this kind of arrogant or narcissistic um like parental i know what to do i'm a know it all i know what you need to do mm. and it nearly every time makes my clients feel like they're not heard or understood right yeah. and i think it comes about i've noticed that it comes about when i feel helpless right? Uh, They're describing something that feels kind of helpless to them. Well, if I do this, I'll end up feeling this. If I do this, I'll end up feeling this. I just feel stuck. I'm in a bind. And my own helplessness starts to rise. And I think, oh, if I'm a good therapist, I will know the answer to get them out of this bind. uh, And so in order to avoid feeling helpless, I will act like I know what they're supposed to do. mm -hmm. And Again, there might be occasional moments where that is actually helpful to a client, but most of the time they're like, I, I, don't, I don't feel like you're hearing me. Right. Right. And so that's a moment for me to go, ooh, some part of me just showed up to cover up feeling helpless. Yeah. Right. I didn't want to feel my own helplessness and really feel their helplessness too. Right. Mm-hmm. And just kind of be like, okay, this is hard. Yeah. This sucks. I don't have an answer. Other than my answer is I'm going to sit here with you and try mm. to be with you in this. And hopefully that will, you know, get us to the next, you know, mile marker, so to speak. Yeah. When you notice that part of you coming out with your clients, like, what do you do? Sometimes I might speak to it. Other times it's all internal. It mm-hmm. depends on the relationship I have with them. How long we've been working together. Sure. Do I have a sense of it being beneficial for them to know about my multiplicity is a question that I might mm-hmm. ask. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk to my clients about multiple self states a lot. And sometimes I, I, I don't talk as much about it. And so if I'm not giving them that psychoeducation, sure. I think I'm more inclined to just kind of hold it and say, huh, I think I... I think I might have, have, you know, misread you or misheard you in yeah. that moment. And we kind of go from that launching point versus, huh, part of me just showed up and maybe made things feel a little bit worse for a second there. Right. I do have a, an experience with a client where, um, so I'm a psychoanalyst. And so I think as far away that you can get from psychoanalysis is life coaching in some ways in, in like the spectrum of uh-huh, like uh-huh. how we do help. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause a life coach is there to tell you what to do. Yeah. Well, I had this experience with a client who just really wanted to know whether he should take a job or not. Mm-hmm. And, um, what, what we ended up talking about was that he likes when this life coach part of me comes out and it does come out every now and then with this particular patient. We're all uh-huh. saying, you know what? I, I, it sounds like this is what you want to do. It sounds like this is what you should do. Uh-huh. And again, that's so not psychoanalytic in the proper classic sure. sense, but it's like he was calling forth a part of me that was helpful to him. And because we could talk about it, that's what made it feel integrative. Right. I was just thinking before you before you gave that example, I was thinking about the way that you would respond to to clients when this part of you comes up. That sounds like you doing for yourself that process of, oh, a part of me showed up that maybe I don't I feel ashamed about or I Mm -hmm. don't like. Right. It's not the thief. It's the narcissistic coach who can tell you what to do. Right. And you as the one with more power and control and all those other weird things that come up between a relationship between an analyst and an Allison, <laughs> which listener that's a client, but for an analyst, um, you are able to, to choose that different pathway right. to acknowledge where we've been, but still get us back to safety. Yes. Right. When you were the one who were kind of, kind of stepping out of line, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is, which is a pretty powerful thing to model and a pretty powerful thing to do. And it sounds like in this relationship with this one client, that part of you isn't actually unhelpful, even though it's not psychoanalytic. Maybe it's not what you 
like advertise yourself as offering or what you intend to do with most of your clients, right. this person has told you that part of you is helpful to me and I want that part of you to show up. Right. If if regulated. Sometimes. If regulated. That's I think the key part about self states is I'm gonna we're just gonna throw all the analogies in the world into this podcast. So the another right, an, another analogy right. that feels apropos given what we're doing here is I like to call it the sound dials. Oh yeah. Analogy. And so if every single part of who we are is a dial on a soundboard, right? And I'm being real, you know, um, simple about this. Obviously, soundboards have all kinds of complicated EQ systems and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. just a volume sound dial, right? On right. on a soundboard of every single self that sometimes we need to turn the volume down on parts of who we are, uh -huh. right? Like I always like to joke, the narcissistic self gets to be turned up on our birthday, Right. right. It's uh -huh. all about us. Uh -huh. It gets to be all about us. Uh -huh. Someone else's birthday, it's probably best if we turn narcissistic self down, right? Because right. we want to celebrate them. We want to, you know, turn on the or turn up the the generous part of who we are, the part of us that has um excitement for other people, that kind of thing. And that yeah. sometimes we have parts of us that we've muted. Mm. Right. And to learn how to say, oh, I need to give that part of me a little bit of voice. I need to turn the volume up a little bit on that part of me so that it can have a place in in who I am. Mm -hmm. And we learn by trial and error, right? Yeah. Like we, we get to practice in these safe enough spaces like therapy or close friendships or romantic partnerships where we get to toy with the volume a little bit and go, ooh, that felt a little too loud for that part of me to be expressing itself in this particular context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like the, the goal is to be integrated and integration it means regulation. Yes. It's it, it kind of like mixing. I mean, you know, I produce this podcast, so maybe this <laughs> resonates with me a little bit yeah. more. But kind of like mixing multiple sources of audio. Mm -hmm. When it's well mixed, you can hear every piece. Mm -hmm. Every piece is playing its own part. If one piece is turned up too loud, then you won't be able to hear the other bits. Yep. Um, yep. I think integration too is more like a casserole than a than baking a cake. Hmm. Right? So you bake a cake, you don't taste you don't take a bite of the cake and say, "Hmm, this tastes like egg and flour and oil and and so on and so forth and sugar." Yeah. You say this tastes like a cake, but when you you make a casserole, you still it's all mushed together, but you can still tell the distinct parts of the casserole. Oh, there's pasta in here, there's rice, there's yeah. there's meat, there's some vegetables and and I can take a bunch of it in one bite meaning like we get to be seen as a collection of selves, mm -hmm. but they still have distinctness in the way that they're experienced. I can take a bite of that green bean from the casserole and experience it at, on its own. And it sounds like that distinction is kind of like the shift in the perspective of what a self is pre-George H. Dubbs right. and post where like the the sort of classic earlier idea was if all these different parts of you cuz even you know Freud Aristotle was talking about different parts yes. of a person Freud but, had ego super ego id yep Aristotle had uh, appetite spirit and re reason right hmm. like this yeah. this idea goes back far and and there was kind of this assumption that that a lot of people shared that if all the parts of you were like working together correctly then you would produce this this cake, this like self, this person who was whole and complete and real and true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing you say is like, actually, maybe that's a fantasy. Maybe that's not really real. Maybe it's healthier to say like, yeah, the different parts of me each show up and they're each kind of enough on their own. And they also kind of need one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. Working together is integration in some ways. I think it's, it's to be honest, I think it's a little bit more frightening to see selfhood mm -hmm. in that way, right? Because yeah. if we can feel like we're aiming towards some sort of cake mm -hmm. understanding of, of selfhood, it's like, oh, if I can just get to that place where I'm like completely cohesive and I know who I am and everybody knows who I am and I'm fully known, all of that, it feels enticing and it can feel a little bit scary to be like, no, it's literally like a 15 passenger van. And there's just different drivers all the time. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the teenage self drives the van into a fire hydrant. Like that's yeah. problematic. But mm -hmm. I do think there's beauty in it too, because we get to continue discovering parts of self and we get to continue evolving into somebody that maybe 
continues to surprise us throughout our life. Yeah. That's delightful. (laughs) And terrifying. It is. Terrifying and delightful. Yeah. Both. I like to I like to think about how and this is this is the direction um, I'm going with the the next book I'm writing mm. how we're meant to be complex we're meant to become more and more complex but we oftentimes say things like I just want life to be more simple right yeah. I just need simplicity and my my theory my working theory is that we want simplicity when we are overwhelmed when we're in some sort of a trauma zone mm. when when we we want simplicity to make us feel safe yeah but i think when we feel safe enough i think we really want to dive into the complexity of who we are the complexity of love the complexity of relationships the complexity of creativity all of those things that i think can come about more when there's more of who we are mm-hmm. to experience, but yeah. it is hard work and it's scary to get to know parts of who we are, especially to use a, a, f- a phrase from Carl Jung, famous psychoanalyst, mm-hmm. the shadow selves, yeah. right? Like we don't want to entertain these shadowy parts of us and say, Ooh, do you belong here in who I am? Cause mm-hmm. you, you annoy me or you embarrass me or you make me feel horribly ashamed or, or whatever. Yeah. But I think Learning to incorporate those parts of who we are is part of the journey toward that complexity that can feel both beautiful and terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Clearly, there's so much more to say here. Yeah. <laughs> infinite selves, right? Infinite things to say. Yep. I keep thinking about Spider-Verse when we talk about the infinite <laughs> selves. I'm like, yeah, Love like it. there's infinite Spider-Man, of course. Just like that. Um, thank you for coming on My the podcast. Before we finish... Um, we like to offer our listeners an experiment, something that they can do to kind of practice and get an experience of what we're talking about. It seems like this is something you've thought a lot about. Uh, do you have a quick and dirty experiment that people can do? To- I do. I like to call it self-state scripts. Okay. Uh, other writers about multiplicity have, have called it different things that are not in my memory right this moment. But the idea being, what if you were to sit down and write out a dialogue an inner dialogue of any moment it could be a very significant moment a moment Mm. that you just had a fight with your partner or a friend you are remembering an experience from seventh grade where you had some struggle with your parents it could be a very beautiful moment doesn't have to be troubling and it could be as um, innocuous as your five minute wait in the grocery store line Um, earlier that day. Uh But the idea being you sit down and we're doing it all in retrospect, but you sit down and you write as well as you can remember, what different thoughts did I have there? What different, and how might that represent different parts of me? Right. Mm -hmm. So the grocery store example might be, um, oh, I saw, I got to the part where I was in line and I saw how many people were there and anxious me showed up and said, oh my God, why? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be late for uh-huh. dinner. I'm this is this is not good. And then maybe the person in front of you engages you in conversation, or maybe you see an interesting uh, magazine on the rack, uh-huh. and you know, curious me just showed up. I want to read about J Lo and Ben, mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. And that's the the very innocuous, benign example. But I think it's helpful if we do it in moments where there's some intensity and to notice like which parts of me showed up. Uh-huh. and often signified by just a thought sometimes yeah. or maybe it's a feeling in your body you get kind of warm and you're like ooh maybe angry me all just sudden, all of a sudden just showed up cuz i feel kind of warm and it can be a 5 minute interaction it could be a 30 minute interaction and just see what happens yeah. see how many parts of you you notice in that interaction and maybe you bring it to your therapist maybe you just spend time thinking about it some more mm-hmm. but i think it's a way to notice your multiplicity yeah and this is a, a bit of foreshadowing, but this this exercise reminds me a lot of the TikToks that you make. Hmm. Like it, it seems like a lot of your TikToks are like a visual sort of skit yeah. <laughs> representation of that. Yeah, yeah. I like to my TikTok handle is the psychoanalyst, the underscore psycho underscore analyst. And I like to show multiplicity. I like to talk mm. about it, but I definitely like to show it. And so there are examples of different parts of me 
in, in interactions that are sometimes meant to be funny and in interactions that are maybe meant to be more serious, but yeah. showing that like, yeah, I have all these different parts of me. Maybe you have all these different parts of you. I mean, I'm assuming that everybody does, but to kind of right. let it softly land and go, what if you considered these different parts of yourself? I like to explore that in video form. It's very fun for me and I, I've enjoyed interacting with people in the comments. So yeah, if you want to experience more about multiplicity, give me a follow on uh, on TikTok. Absolutely. Uh, and and we'll we'll mention all those handles again and plugs. Um, so and if if someone is listening to this episode and is like, oh man, an hour and a half isn't long enough. This it won't be an hour and a half, but it might be close to an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, uh, if someone is interested in learning more about this, where would you point them? What resources would you say seek this? Yeah, uh, the first one is is going to be a, a shameless plug for my book. Uh, it's called The Curtain: Tales of Human Love and Personality. It came out about a year and a half ago. It is I call it a, a mental health memoir or a psychology memoir. So it's mm. some some stories of my own life interspersed with teaching about trauma, dissociation, and multiplicity of self. And so yeah. it is written not for clinicians. It's written for all of us out there that are just trying to wander the world and figure out who we are. And it's aimed at learning to love all the different parts of who we are, because I think that's what integration is said another way, learning to love all the different parts of who we are. So yeah. pick up that book. It's on Amazon. Um, I think there are, there are a few other books. One that I like to point to is a woman named Rita Carter over in England. She wrote a book called Multiplicity. I think that's a that's a good book too. Lots of there's more clinical examples in that. I don't mm. think it's as memoir oriented in its presentation. So if memoir is not your thing, that's probably a great resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also add if uh, if you're interested in things like psychoanalysis, you know, working with the unconscious, Philip Bromberg, he died a little over a year ago, but mm -hmm. he was um, one of the key writers within psychoanalysis regarding multiplicity of self. And he wrote a book yeah. called Standing in the Spaces that I think it it reads it reads well for clinicians and uh, mm -hmm. non-clinicians alike. I think there's some good stories about working with clients. And I think that he just utilizes different forms of, of literary culture in, yeah. in his writing. So he's a good one. Um, internal family systems theory is hot right now. Yes, IFS. So they, they, their language is parts. Um, mm -hmm. Their, their version of multiplicity tends to have a little bit more, and this is my bias, but it feels a little bit more like it's rigidly held titles and understandings of parts mm -hmm. of self. And I'm mm -hmm. a little bit more fluid but if if having things kind of be a bit more solidly defined for mm -hmm. you and when you understand your multiplicity, uh, internal family systems would be a great place to to explore. Google it. You'll probably sure. find plenty of things be uh, from there to to understand and get your feet wet with this uh, this idea of multiplicity of self. So maybe if you're someone who likes personality types, for instance, then you might like internal family systems and the the sort of the the categories that it gives you to play with. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, there was a recent article in the New Yorker written by Leslie Jameson about imposter syndrome. Mm. And I think imposter syndrome is a part of our multiplicity, right? Sure. I think yeah. it's a yeah. it's a way of feeling disconnected from a self. And that was an interesting read because she talks about multiplicity of self. So I think it yeah. is showing up in culture more and more. I think we're at we're at maybe doesn't get taken as seriously is because there aren't easy answers when we understand that we're multiple and we want easy answers a lot of times. Yeah. And so I think that's a tricky spot to navigate, but mm. I think the more we explore it, I think we can find that there are easy ways or easier ways mm. to engage it. And so that it doesn't have to feel so overly um, complex in ways that don't allow us to feel like we're getting somewhere with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of that. Um, let's let's plug your pluggables. We've got your book, yep. The Curtain, yep, uh, which is available on Amazon. Yep. Wait, The Curtain colon Tales of Human Tales. Love and Personality. Tales of Human Love and Personality available on Amazon. Your TikTok, uh, the underscore psycho underscore analyst. Correct. Ha. Well played. Anything else you'd like to plug or places where you'd like to be found? 
Those are the the main places where the newer material is coming out for me. I I have a a handle on Instagram called the Edge of the Couch where I occasionally post things. There's clips mm-hmm. of my book on there. Um but really TikTok I think is is where I'm trying to uh, find myself because I think video and being able to show while also talk about art is sure. is an important element of it. So and then your new book, what what's it called? It does not have a title it? yet, but it's okay. about uh, rigidity and it's about simplicity and complexity and the ways that we our, our rigidities are sometimes signifiers of our trauma. Fascinating. Yeah. So let's agree that when that book comes out, you'll come back on the podcast. We'll talk Love about to. that for another Love hour. Love to. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And. Uh, Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Very special thanks to Brian Pendergast for coming on to this episode. Links to everything that he mentioned, including his own social media and book, are in the show notes. The Relational Psych Podcast is a production of Relational Psych, a mental health clinic providing depth-oriented psychotherapy and psychological testing in person in Seattle and virtually throughout Washington State. If you are interested in psychotherapy or psychological testing for yourself or a family member, links to our contact information are in the show notes. If you are a psychotherapist and would like to be a guest on the show, or are a listener with a suggestion for someone you'd like us to interview, you can contact me at podcast at relationalpsych.group. The Relational Psych Podcast is hosted and produced by me, Tyson Connor. Carly Claney is our executive producer, with technical support by Sam Claney and Allie Ray. Our music is by Ben Lewis. We love you, buddy.